I like when people can fit in that fun dialogue. It's good. You brought one of the Eastern Tree people to an entirely new ecosystem. And I'm standing up here now looking out across a sea of, of smiling faces of, of grass people. Our roots touch in sharing the mission of building healthy soil. And this morning, what I want to do with you is to walk what we call in the herbal world the medicine way with plants and fungi. To embrace the mycelium, to find hope in earth stewardship, and embark on fungal rifts that make us better growers and better ranchers. So to do that, we're going to go a little bit more than just the phrase carbon farming to the ones who really do the work. We like to take a lot of credit and do our studies, and, and that's all fine and, and noble. But the ones who do the work are the fungi in the soil. And we're going to be talking about what are known as mycorrhizal fungi. So let's just start with the roots of, of what that word is. Myco, in the, in the Greek language, was the fungal realm. Rhiza is the root zone. And it is the union of fungus and root that makes a mycorrhiza. The two must be together. So that, that's kind of our, our baseline of where we start launching ourselves into fungal consciousness. Now all this is part of the soil food web, and, and you're all familiar with the soil food web. Here we're talking about the acidomycetes and the bacteria and the saprotrophic fungi that break down our organic matter. That in turn releases mineral nutrients so plants can grow, and, and there's protozoa and nematodes that eat, eat the smaller microbes, and the whole thing is like a giant feeding frenzy. And yet that is the engine that runs this planet. As an orchardist, um, I come from northern New Hampshire. That's what I meant by a different ecosystem. Um, I know that this is my team. Yes, I have the trees and I pick the apples, but, but the ones who are, I'm working with, I'm stewarding, are the microbes in the soil. And, and my main job as the captain, and that, that's already kind of an arrogant thing to think, that I'm the captain of the, this magnificent system. My main job is not to screw things up, which is actually a nice way of looking at it, because <laughs> once you start to realize there are so many ways to screw it up, and you start toning it down, and things start working, it, it really starts to flow. Um, this realm has a lot of players involved. And when I stand on healthy, diverse ground, underneath the imprint of one of my footsteps are 300 miles of hyphae, fungal mycelium, that connect plants throughout the plant community and bring resiliency to the ecosystem. And in that sense, it takes me a mere six steps of walking along the, the gossamer filaments of mycorrhizal hyphae to go from northern New Hampshire here to New Mexico. And it's, it's just an incredible realm to contemplate the depth of that. This is a picture of the nutrient transfer mechanism of an endomycorrhizal fungus inside this cell of the root of a plant. Um, if you look at it, it kind of looks like a tree. Flip it upside down, it looks like the feeder root system of a plant. If you've been trained medically, you might be thinking about the alveoli in our lungs, where oxygen is, is transferred and keeps us alive. In, in herbalism, we have an ancient concept called the doctrine of signatures, where the way a plant grows, the way it looks, sometimes will suggest that's how you might use this for human medicine. To me, when I look at this arbuscule, that's the name of the, the transfer mechanism, I see a connection to life itself. Um, and it's really critical that I understand it. Long time ago, when there wasn't land showing and the sea, the ocean started to recede, the uh, predecessors of what would become vascular plants were stuck in tidal pools. This is about 450 million years ago. Those vascular plants to be did not have roots and they struck a surrogate deal with the swimming fungi in the ocean water also stuck in those tidal pools. And that's what's launched this whole symbiotic connection between plants and fungi. At one point, every plant had this connection. 
now through extreme habitat and evolution and various scenarios, some plants have lost that affiliation with mycorrhizal fungi. Um, things like brassicas, things like pigweed, um, things like lamb's quarters. But most plants not only can have this affiliation, they want this affiliation. This is the normal way by which plants get nutrients. When that system is broken, it, the plant can still function. That's where we get into the whole NPK fertilization scenario. But it, it isn't the same as having that connection with the fungi themselves. So many advantages flow out of this mycorrhizal connection. Um, we're going to explore what it means to have plant friends and fungal networks that bring nutrients from further and further afield than a single plant can just reach by itself. Um, the ability to send messages to say pests are on the scene, to say that herbivores are starting to graze heavily here. Other plants sometimes pick up that signal and then create certain phytochemical compounds to, to resist that pressure. Um, the whole notion of stimulating the immune function of plants, and I'm going to very briefly look at that because it's very relevant to what we're talking about here, ties in here. And all this together is what makes ecosystems resilient. And there's one more little thing. Um, it's these fungal plant dynamics that tuck away carbon in the soil. So mycorrhizal fungi, when their hyphae reach out through the soil to gather nutrients and explore new spaces, they're able to do that with a degree of rigidity because they produce a compound known as lamellin, which is a protein substance formed in conjunction with bacteria. Everyone's involved here. And that lamellin is made up of 30% carbon. And when fungi withdraw, come back towards the plant at certain seasons in the year, the lamellin is left behind. That lamellin also works as the glue that sticks together clay and silt and sand particles to make soil aggregates. So soil aggregates, we know that's a good thing. So there we have more carbon being locked in. But, but those soil aggregates are actually created by the fungi to serve as gated communities where the fungi and smaller bacteria can find refuge from the protozoa and the nematodes. In those gated communities is the place where human substances are also tucked which are now protected from being consumed by other microbes. This is the key part of how carbon is put into the soil. Again, we have our human notions of what we need to do to steward what Gordon just called the terrain up above. But down below, this is where the action is centered through the work of the mycorrhizal fungi. So just briefly, there, there's different types of mycorrhizal fungi. The ectomycorrhizal fungi have an affiliation with the trees of the forest. So these are the softwoods and the hardwoods. And the one thing I want to point out about ecto is, is they have a ability to reach much further afield with their hyphae. The other types, the endomycorrhizae, are what affiliate with the grasses and the legumes and the woodsy shrubs and the fruit trees with the medicinal herbs with the wildflowers. And endomycorrhizae are the ones that actually penetrate into those cells. There's only about 300 species of endomycorrhizal fungi that work in the tundra, in the temperate ecosystems, in the um, going into the, the tropical ecosystems. The same fungi are involved in all those different places. Those 300 species of fungi have affiliations with over 250,000 species of plants. So those are the main ones we're going to look at here today and understand a little bit more. Now, our understanding of this realm, we're, we're kind of, we're kind of like in grade school in terms of what we know about this. It was only in 1881 that a Polish botanist identified the fungi seen on the roots of trees as a symbiotic organism, something that was giving to the plant as well as taking. It was not a disease per se. By the early 1900s, through the use of, of microscopes, people could look at the fungi that were penetrating into the root cells. But at that time, you know, World War I has not happened yet. The Spanish flu that would kill some 50 million people in 1918 
hasn't happened yet. We were not aware of what germs were, what viruses were. And so fungi were grouped in that category of a big mystery that causes illness and disease. And, and it was hard for people to make this shift and realize there was something positive happening here, something much bigger than that. In the uh, 1920s, 1924, a man named Rudolf Steiner gave a series of agricultural lectures in Austria. And, and these would become the basis of what's known today as the biodynamic farm movement. And Steiner was familiar with those microscopic drawings. He knew that these fungi had a symbiotic relationship. But he also intuited much further that plant roots, a plant community as a whole, connected together underground that fungal networks were formed that also could share resources, could share nutrients. And he referred to this as the common root bean. This is 1924. Today, scientists refer to this as the common mycorrhizal network. And in, in a mycorrhizal network, if you have different species of fungi involved with different plants. Some of the fungi tap into the same plant within the plant protoplasm nutrients and signaling can be transferred onward to others. And this is that common root being that Steiner was referring to. Um, and, and this is what we build into resilient ecosystems. This is why we want lots of different plants, because that in turn can mean lots of different species of plant, of, of fungi being on the scene. Now, one of the practical applications of this for me as an orchardist, is when I started to learn about what are called the, the soft hardwoods, species like willow and popple and alder, things that you would see in those riparian zones. Um, these are trees, species, that share a connection with both endomycorrhizal fungi and ectomycorrhizal fungi. These are, these are plants that can take the gains being made by the long reach of the ectotypes and transfer it to the endotypes. So they're very important players in the orchard ecosystem, but really in all ecosystems. Because we're going to learn that those ectotypes have the ability to get minerals from bedrock. <coughs> this is a picture of my orchard. It's not just apple trees and grass. And it's, it's that diversity that makes possible what I call holistic orcharding. Now, remembering that we really don't know that much. Um, scientists are starting to do studies and they have to do it in a reductionist fashion. Um, this particular study was all about just seeing would plants offer more carbon sugars, the photosynthates, in trade for phosphorus. Uh, this was a clover plant connected with three different fungal systems. And, and they learned that the answer to that was yes. Um, Something was going on there. Decisions were being made. But on the same hand, this is not an integrated trial. But we don't have the ability to see this big picture. So I'm, I'm going to do just a very, very slight political thing right now with apologies to fungal and fungi everywhere. Um, a certain errant species comes knocking, tells the plant, I have got the greatest phosphorus. There has never been anyone who's had better phosphorus than I have. Trust me, this is great phosphorus. <laughs> it actually, it actually doesn't work that way. <laughs> Plants will dedicate as much as two thirds of those photosynthates that they use to grow and reproduce at certain points in the growing season, depends on the plant. Um, to the underground economy, those photosynthates, those carbon sugars, Another word, way of looking at it is as carbon currency. And, and the way the whole integrated mycorrhizal network works is more along, along the lines of this. You're growing in the bright sunshine. You're producing lots of photosynthesis. In a sense, we could call you quite wealthy. The plants, through the roots, through the mycorrhizal fungi, recognize that you could actually afford to pay more for that phosphorus. You're going to be charged a little bit more. And that makes it possible to share some of that phosphorus or some of those trace minerals with plants over there that are more in the shade. And if you start to think about it, 
This whole network is working much more along the lines of a social democracy. Bernie Sanders would love this stuff. This is, this is what's going on. This is that underground economy that makes a plant ecosystem, that makes my orchard more than just apple trees and some grass. And it's, it's this networking that's invisible to our eye that is really the most important thing for us to understand as growers, as ranchers, as people who love this planet. Because this is where that whole carbon sequestration takes place through the means of, of the fungi. Understanding how fungi carry forward into the future through root fragments, through spores, is where I get a lot more practical. You know, in the roundtable discussions later today and tomorrow, we'll, we'll do more of this. This is a picture of a pig skin puffball. Um, don't eat these, they're poisonous. This is an ectotype fungi. In the forest, those fungi have fruiting bodies. So when we talk about gathering edible mushrooms like chanterelles or boletes, those are mycorrhizal fungi, the fruiting bodies, which are sporulated. So ecto can move around quite readily. Um, but endo mycorrhizae sporulate in the soil, in root fragments. And they don't move around underground as rapidly. When Mount St. Helens blew up in the 1980s um, in Washington, in the blast zone, not only were the plant communities totally destroyed, but the fungal networks were totally destroyed by that high heat. And it took 20 some years for the fungal network to redevelop, for plant growth to really be able to launch again in that blast zone. So I'm pointing that out just because I want you to understand that when land gets degraded, land gets abused, there's quite a timeline to get back to really a healthier condition. In a healthy, diverse ecosystem, there will be as many as 20 to 50 different species of fungi at play. This is just building kind of that crescendo of the common mycorrhizal network. Different fungi have different specialties. Some will be the ones that bring zinc. Others might bring manganese. Some will be the ones that help jumpstart plants in a cold soil in spring. Um, others will be there when the ecosystem, a perennial ecosystem, gets more established. They play different roles. So, again, we don't have to know what the name of every fungi and what each fungi specifically does with each specific plant, but just to know that there's a lot of things going on here. Um, there are certain fungi, Desicola, Fasciculatum, and, and Mossad, that are particularly adept at taking moisture from a wetter area of an ecosystem and sharing it through the drier part of the ecosystem. So this becomes really relevant when we start talking about making more resilient ecosystems in drier areas um, in, in terms of restoring deserts and restoring grasslands on, in a drought year. It's, it's the mycorrhizal fungi that you can bank on to help with water distribution. This whole <coughs> evolutionary pathway 450 million years ago it began has pointed relentlessly towards cooperation and support networks as a way to proceed in life. The ecologist Frank Egler, who is a contemporary of, of Rachel Carson, said exactly what I, what I feel in contemplating all this. Nature is not more complicated than we think. Nature is more complicated than we can think. I'm, I'm quite comfortable with that. It's like, it's awesome, all this talk about soil and fungi. Um, let's, let's quickly just introduce the plant side of all this. So healthy plant metabolism starts with photosynthesis. That's where the carbon sugars come from that drive growth and can be traded with the microbes down below. Nitrogen comes into play, proteins are created. And if all of this is going along at a good pace, plants are gonna produce fatty acid compounds, these form lipids, that's part of their defensive mechanism against disease. And then they go on from there to produce specific constituents that are, are basically the immune function of the plant. Photosynthesis can be robust or it can be sluggish. And it is driven by the availability of all the different trace minerals. Mineralization is a, a key part of 
succeeding at growing healthy fruit, at succeeding at, at farming, at succeeding even in your pastures and your grasslands. Mineralization is what's going to make photosynthesis more robust. That's going to be more plant sugars. That's going to be more trade with fungi. Now, I mentioned how those ectomycorrhiza fungi, the, the tree species types, have this ability to reach a lot further. This ties into mineralization. Fungi, hyphae, gather to themselves bacteria that line along the, the length of the hyphae. And as that hyphae starts to penetrate into bedrock, out of the hyphal tip, carbon sugars are released which feed the bacteria further back, who release organic acids, which in turn then freeze things like calcium, magnesium, potassium, and the different trace minerals from rock, which the hyphae picks up and then takes back to the plant. So this is a way soils remineralize without our involvement. You know, I, I get involved with foliar sprays in my orcharding that include trace minerals. I sprinkle things like azomite clay, on my compost piles because that's rich in all the minerals from A to Z. I feed kelp, kelp meal onto the alfalfa pellets that we feed our sheep in the winter months because I know that kelp has all kinds of trace minerals. So there's ways we can do it, but here's nature's way of doing it. Now, I had art, artwork done for my new book, Mycorrhizal Planet by Alara Tangway. And this was one I had to have her do specifically because I didn't want my book to be X-rated. Um, but this is a picture of exactly what I was just talking about. So photosynthesis brings plant sugars, nitrogen comes into play. And nitrogen is combined with those sugars to produce proteins. Trace minerals are important to forming the enzymes that quicken this process. This is relevant because when the amino acids in plant sap do not come together to form complete proteins, it provides a feeding ground for foliar pests and for fungal disease. So just having robust photosynthesis, having lots of trace minerals on the scene, is suddenly talking about a whole new language. It's not disease happens because I'm trying to make a living growing apples. It's health happens because mineralization allows this healthy plant metabolism to go full bore. Inside the wall of a cell is a cell membrane, which is a phospholipid bilayer. And, and that fatty bilayer will incorporate complete proteins, essentially take it out of this plant protoplasm. So this is kind of the mechanism by what this, of how this is taking place. This is why this is important. This concept of a cell membrane. Um, in creation, beneficial patterns consist, consistently show up. And our Earth, our precious planet, the skin of our Earth is only essentially a few inches thick, a few feet when land stewardship is being taken done rightly. That's a very skin, skinny, skinny layer that is holding life's sacred trust in place. And it's much like the cell membrane. And in that layer is this vast fungal mycelium, the one that allows me to go in six steps from New Hampshire to New Mexico. And the more we steward that, the more we create that, we're supporting the mechanism which holds life's sacred trust. So plants go on from there in the robust fashion to create these fatty acids, to, to create the lipids that are going to form the cuticle, the waxy cuticle on the surface of leaves that protects the plant from disease and holds moisture in. Um, a lot of fatty acids will be directed towards seed development. Plants can produce three to four times as much fatty acids when photosynthesis is robust. But we're kind of building this cascade of energy. Um, and the more fatty acids, that's going to be good for the fungal networks because that's one of the things that fungi feed on. Plants go on to a fourth phase of healthy plant metabolism. Now we're talking about resistance metabolites, phenolic compounds that are essentially the immune function of the tree, of, of whatever plant we're talking about. 
And this, this is where herbalists get quite involved with things like terpenoids and flavonoids and then alkaloids, and which constituent helps us. But the plants are making these constituents to begin with because that's their immune function. All of this is driven by the fact that when plants take up their nutrients in partially built form, they don't have to use as much energy to advance that healthy plant metabolism I've been describing. The microbes in the soil, from the mycorrhizal fungi to the saprotrophic fungi, to the bacteria and the cytomites, all which really kind of congregate and have a good time in the root zone of plants, are the ones that deliver partially built nutrition to plants. In a sense, we can think of the microbes as the ones who chew cud so that the plants, like the cow, can go on in, in its daily journey. And the more energy that's saved, the healthier the plant. How did we get there? I, I often teach in my orchard workshops. I'm gonna teach you all these ideas, mention some big words, and you can forget all of it. You just have to remember that whatever came in this year, what I want coming out here is mineralization and fungal, making things fungal. And, and that's why I do what I do in my holistic orcharding. This is what's happening when you do what you do by not letting those animals graze throughout the whole growing season, everything that we just heard about. Um, it's about letting the microbes chew cut. Now, the biggest honcho in all this is actually the mycorrhizal fungi. The fact that those nutrient transfer mechanisms are in the cell itself, um, there's a lot of pressure going on there to continue that relationship. And arbuscules only live on the order of about five to seven days, and then they dissolve into the plant sap. They dissolve as proteins, as lipids, as partially built nutrition. And, and this is the means by which we really up robust plant, healthy plant metabolism in a big, big way. So when I think about the fungal realm, I've been talking about mycorrhizal fungi. That, that's maybe 5% of the species of fungi out there. The, the, the sap probes that break down organic matter, that's really key to the ongoing cycling of carbon. Um, there's all sorts of, of fungal species in the air. On the surface of my fruit trees, my apples, the surface of your pasture grasses, whatever shrubs are growing around there. The endophytic fungi we're only beginning to think about. Um, so just remember, out of ignorance, out of the slow pace by which we really start to understand nature, things are going on there. And yet, bottom group, the fungi that cause disease, the parasitic and pathogenic fungi, that's what we focused on. Even, even though we now understand symbiosis, going back to the turn of the previous century, for the last hundred plus years, we've obsessed on the disease part of the picture and we've sprayed fungicides to grow our food crops because we haven't supported healthy plant metabolism. Well, those fungicides, they drip. They fall on the soil. They kill the mycorrhizal fungi. They break the network. Everything I've been describing is now gone, and we're, we're into so much more unhealthy plants. This is a picture of a stomata, the respiratory cell on the underside of the leaf, and this stomate has a few guards. Um, there are some yeasts, which are single-celled single fungi, and you can see hyphal strands in the one end of, of the opening, and there are some bacteria. There, there are fungal diseases that actually have figured out a strategy to send their hyphae through that open door into the plant tissues. The more we keep that guardianship up through competitive colonization, things like effective microbes and compost tea, which is something I get into as a fruit grower. That's the way to address the rest of the story and deal with possible fungal disease. Fukuoka said, the healing of the land and the purification of the human spirit is the same process. That's what I love about my work. I suspect that's what you love about your work. Healing the land, putting carbon back in the soil, helping fungi build those soil aggregates. At the same time, it's the most blessed thing that we can be doing. <laughs> Except, <laughs> we seem to be going backwards more often than not as 
the culture. And just give me a minute to find my right page here. And many, many people are just not tuned in to how the planet's life support system works, of, of how important it is to do soil stewardship, um, to support these fungal networks. Now, we can think that the answer lies with government and with corporations, but in truth, that is not where the answer is going to come from. The answer is going to come from all of you. From farmers, from people who work the land, who work, put their hands in the soil, who embrace getting dirty and knowing that fungi underlie all the good work that we do up above. This is why I'm hopeful. You know, industrial agriculture, industrial forestry have destroyed these fungal networks. For the last couple decades, the Quivira Coalition has been meeting and getting more people involved with, well, what, how do we work in the Southwest ecosystem to restore health to plant communities, to get that carbon back in the soil? Um, and I like being hopeful. Um, I find our most motivating emotions are concern, interest, and hope. Um, otherwise, it's very easy to feel hopeless in these times and, and to feel the fear of a, possibly our civilization collapsing in on itself. There's a lot of humans. And, you know, I'm, I'm beyond capable of, of being able to understand how it's all going to play out. But I spent the last couple of years writing a book called My Horizon Planet, and I, I put together what I call the non-disturbance principle. It's, it's a lot like the words, how do you find the radical center? Um, being grateful is a good place to be, regardless of what your path is. Not screwing up. Um, knowing that insecticides, herbicides, fungicides break the way na nature does health tells us we need to change. Doing fungal things means providing organic matter. When I spray my orchard, one of the primary things in that spray tank are fatty acids from seed oils. Um, it's a whole other construct, the way I'm going about this. All the Leopold um, stated the land ethic this way. A land ethic changes the role of homo sapiens from conqueror of the land community to plain member and citizen of it. It implies respect for his fellow members and also respect for the community. We can't mess with the fungi. We can't disturb the impeccable. The way nature does health, the way nature does mineralization, another ear, ear thing, diversity, diversity. The more diversity, the more we're going to reach this point. These are some drawings of bio a biological transition in a grassland. It takes several years to start to get things to kick into place. There was one Japanese orchardist who went cold turkey on the chemicals, and it wasn't until nine years later that he started producing healthy crops. And, and we don't have a lot of time, but it takes time to restore all these degraded lands, these degraded places. Bill Mollison, whose, whose work became the, known as, as permaculture, uh, working with perennial agricultural systems, um, really honored the way of subsistence farmers, looking at how people had managed long before the chemicals came on the scene, long before we had this tremendous mechanical ability to churn the soil over. Um, and he spoke that now's the time. We need to get going. We need to give young people a chance to get involved. Um, we need to restore ecosystems across the planet. When I teach about fungal carryover, that, that lies at the heart of it. And, and I can talk to farmers or orchardists or gardeners, or apparently I can even talk to, to ranchers now. Um, it's all about understanding some of the connections of cover crop cocktails, 
that, that involves lots of plant diversity and rebuilding a field. Um, knowing that something like sedan grass has an affiliation with 50 different species of mycorrhizal fungi. You plant sedan grass, you inoculate that sedan grass, you've now launched that spore connection for whatever plants are to come. Um, and, and, and there's many, many ways that we can get into talking about that. Inoculating seeds, roots, bulbs, there's a time to do that. There's a time to make that investment depending on how degraded the land base is that you're working with. Um, and primarily you're going to do that with cover crops. Um, let's go back to the, the, the root meaning of mycorrhiza, fungus root. The fungus alone doesn't do it. I have to emphasize, this is a partnership. Those plants photosynthesizing are really key. Photosynthesizing as much of the year as possible. This, this is where the notion of bare fallows, leaving ground not in cover for the winter months, just totally fails because photosynthesis stops. The fungal connection cannot continue to build. Carbon cannot continue to be put in the soil. Where I live, cover crops like oats, tillage radish, and field pea all winter kill. So you will see much of, of our herb fields and our, our gardens in that cover, cover crop scenario because that's a great way to stop the fungi system going into the winter months and come out in the spring with this perfectly mulched ground filled with spores. Um, it takes two to tango. Keep that fungus root partnership to the fore when you think about going about what you do. Thich Nhat Hanh, a Buddhist monk from Vietnam, talked about our need to form loving communities. I think Gravira Coalition, you're one of these communities. Um, and it's so important that people connect and support each other, encourage each other, inspire each other. And I hope that you're starting to hear the fungal threads in this. The whole idea of agroforestry, of, of converting monoculture fields back to lush pasture with a tree component, um, is a beautiful thing because diversity is woven into this. Ecto-mycorrhizal connections are being woven into the trees that are being planted there. The grazing that's done between the tree rows in a rotational fashion is driving plant roots deeper, which means mycorrhizal fungal connections are going deeper, which means carbon is being stored deeper in the soil. This is Gordon Tooley um, doing his work with key lime plowing. This is about breaking up compacted soils with the no-till seed drill, introducing robust plants that can get mycorrhizal fungal connections back in place, making possible the planting of tree strips um, in a more broader fashion, but those shelter belts, in a sense, hold snow drifted snow. That helps with moisture distribution across the land. All this kind of work, um, what you all do with, with rational grazing, um, this, is, this is the moment that, that my big connection with sheep shines, and it's not a very big connection. <laughs> um, all of this work together, what we're each called to do, you know, we can't change the whole world, but we can change our world. We can change the land that's been given into our stewardship, restore it to health, restore it back to the connections that are going to keep our planet humming. And, and there's so many opportunities to do this, and there's such a need to do this. Um, our collective future pivots on many people coming to understand that soil fungi matter, that plant <coughs> ecosystems must be respected, that soil stewardship is our highest calling. Such has been said before, but now the jig is truly up. We either recognize the urgency involved at this critical juncture, or the next century won't necessarily include the human race. And it's where we're at, and I'm just speaking bluntly. This isn't political talk, this is earth talk. Um, Rachel Carson, whose book Silent Spring, 
changed the dynamics, got people thinking about things like DDT and its impact on the environment. Talked about reserves of strength that will endure as long as, as life lasts. Um, I think the real gift of the fungi and the plants, because again, it's a mutualistic partnership, isn't so much the carbon solution as it is showing us a way forward. That to cooperate is to find bounty for all involved. Fungal networking doesn't overlook the youngest or the least in the crowd. Most telling is that of one life giving to the next, when I refer to hyphal lysis, partially built nutrition. Um, it is written in the book of Matthew, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. This testament speaks passionately to our human hearts, but it's about far more than just our species. You know, do we have ears to hear what the mycorrhizae are telling us? Do we have eyes to see what tiny critters do on behalf of the whole? Beneath our feet is the teaching and the blessing. And my take on a future and a hope lies in tangible things that my family and I can do on land we love, just like all of you are doing. And this connection <coughs> to being, to the land, and to each other is to be celebrated. Um, the long-term storage of carbon in soil depends on the ability of healthy soil to form aggregates. That's achieved by mycorrhizal fungi and mycorrhizal plants. Hyphae and roots joined as one. Each and every mycorrhiza pulsating with nutrient flow, making our lives possible. Tomorrow can be redeemed by honoring this fundamental earth pact. It really comes down to two simple concepts to take forward. One, promote healthy plant metabolism as the guiding paradigm in growing anything. And two, think and think again about ways that you can least disturb the soil ecosystem um, and thereby reestablish mycelial connection everywhere. The fungi and the plants together will sing this soil redemption song for us as the fungi and the plants always have. Thank you. Accelerated by introducing more diversity, both 
below ground in terms of the fungi that are there, and above ground in terms of the plants that are there. And I hope I've given you some, some insight into how it's not just about grass, and I know you all know that. I use that term grass meaning kind of the, the ground cover, the green ground cover. Um, but there's a tie-in to the woodsy component. That, that's where long-term fertility is really derived from, the breakdown break of lignans from woodsy plant material. And it's not just that bacterial bore. So it, it's this whole collage together that, that's making what we need to do possible. Question over here. Question in the middle. Hey, Michael. Uh, thanks a lot for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, I have a question that kind of ties into what we were just talking about. In terms of um, managing the succession of your uh, food forest in New Hampshire, you were talking about bridge trees. And I was wondering if this is kind of like the concept of a pioneer species, where, where you would, it would be almost a sacrificial tree that you would cut down continuously and feed to your longer growing or longer term fruit trees. Um, I'm asking because I have done some of this in uh, Australia, actually at uh, Jeff Lawton's farm, and uh, we would continuously cut down these pioneer species to feed them to the slower growing fruit trees, and I'm wondering if the bridge trees that you mentioned are this same kind of uh, concept. You've totally got it. So what I spoke of with respect to bridge trees is, is the photosynthesizing of those plants supporting a certain fungal system. On the other hand, when I coppice things like willow and alder to either chip or lay the branches underneath the crop plants that I'm growing, the fruit trees, I now bring their soluble lignans into play in yet another way where fungi break it down and create humic substances. So, so you're, you're identifying, I talked about one half of that action, and you've identified the other half of that. Back, back to the uh, corner over here on your right. Hey, um, it seems like you're probably kind of new to the area, but I don't know if it's the mycorrhizae uh, fairly zone specific, and you know uh, where to obtain mycorrhizae that is. Here towards our zone here. So, ectomycorrhizae, which affiliate with the trees, are a little more, they've got certain tree friends, and that's what they're going to work with in certain regions. But the endomycorrhizae, which affiliate with 80% of the plants on the planet, the, the plants that you're looking at and talking about here, as well as what I'm talking about there, there's only 300 of them. Nature got it right from the beginning. And there hasn't been a lot of splitting off into new species. And so, for instance, those three fungi I had on the screen that I said are very good at helping move water. I'm going to find the same fungi up in New Hampshire that you find here. Um, we're going to find the same species of fungi in the tropics. The endotypes have, are very cosmopolitan. They have this ability to affiliate with many different plants and typically a commercial inoculum if, if you have a cause to do this um, consists of nine to twelve different species the ones that seem to be at the heart of the action in all these different places and, and I will explore more in the, the roundtable session indigenous mycorrhizal fungi uh, and, that, and that question of what are the options but to answer your question it's, it's really the same players involved because they know how to do it really well. Question here in the middle. Uh, I've got a question relating to grazing management and bush encroachment. I haven't figured out until now why the bush encroachment happens is to get the mycorrhizal fungi back into the system. In my ranching practice, I've managed to get uh, invasive brush to die, really significantly die back without, graze, without uh, the brush being grazed. And then it resurges a few years on. So I'm having this ding-dong battle. battle. It's, if I get massive die-off, 
things look great from a grass recovery point of view, and then I'm getting... Can you explain a bit... Well, I don't understand why that's necessarily happening. Can you explain that from a grazing perspective, why invasive brush would die off in large swathes and then regenerate? There's obviously a, a cyclical something happening. Is there any explanation for that from a mycorrhizal point of view? Well, to be, to be honest, I'm just learning about the ecosystems here in, in more of an in-depth way than I have previously. Um, when mycorrhizal connections fall apart, invasive plants have more of an opportunity to come in. But what you're doing in terms of robust grazing, now they use that word, um, I don't see that breaking the mycorrhizal connection. So the grasses, the legumes, all the different plants that you're growing and want have that endo affiliation. Shrubby brush is also endo related. And it isn't until you get to those more willow, alder, popple, birch, soft maple that you get to the ecto part, which I like to see that in the ecosystem because of that connection to minerals. But no, I don't have an answer to what you just asked me. <laughs> right up here in the two right. So why is uh, farming converted to uh, what we currently have been doing, and apparently have been doing almost since Mesopotamia, where we are very disruptive and, and Basically, the losses have happened to fungi by what we're doing. Why, what's the incentives, or what's the what's been so compelling in human civilization to break those bonds? We got into agriculture, and we got into it with the notion that you break open the ground to plant the crop, and we focused on the crop without realizing that the crop was really an outpouring of a whole plant community connected by fungi. And now that we're starting to have insights into this, things like permaculture and agroforestry and the holistic grazing, you know, they're all parts of the same answer. Um, we're still gonna do agriculture, that's obvious. We need to feed our population. But we can do it wiser now. Um, and we can team, team up with what are truly the more intelligent species on the planet. We'd like to claim it was us, but there's others who, who are wiser. And by encouraging that, by bringing that back into our agriculture, and many people are doing many great things. I mean, again, my hope lies in, in farmers <laughs> and growers and ranchers because once you hear how these things are connected and you take interest in it and you're concerned about it and you do something about it, that's what's going to make regenerative agriculture what it needs to be. Coming to you. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It's always very inspiring to hear about fungus and soil health in general. Um, I just have a few specific questions. Um, I think obviously if you're going to plant even a seed, you do have to disturb minorly. And um, in the dry environments here, you don't really get biological de decomposition of uh, cover crops as quickly as you would in the Northeast. So uh, I've been considering strip tilling, just like minor uh, shallow cutting to then plant into. Um, I, I was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. And also, um, <laughs> we've, we're getting into the growing trees right now. We've been talking about, uh, in your book, you had um, wanting different sizes of meal of wood, basically. And he was saying, and we were debating whether or not it's um, the size matters or if it's like, you know, green versus drier, uh, so like more green um, cuttings from a tree versus just really dry cuttings from a tree would also provide the same amount, which you really need different sizes as well. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. 
So two questions. The first to do with strip tilling. So I, I said we need to limit how much we disturb the soil. But I recognize we have other goals. So we've got to integrate that. Um, so the shallow till uses seed drill like Gordon does. Now that's all that subsoil uh, plow that Gordon takes to do the key line plowing. Um, that's soil disturbance, but it's, it's not the whole big chunk of the earth's skin in, across that whole field. So I, there are ways to go about this wisely and achieve goals and change plant communities to be more mycorrhizal and what have you and, and bring organic, more organic matter back for microbes to consume. So that, that part's good. Um, when you talk about Romeo chip wood, this is a, a concept that was developed in Quebec at Laval University, and, and Romeo just meaning the smaller wood of the tree, the buds and twigs, because from two inches in diameter and up, 75% of the minerals are stored in the inner green bark. So to use the smaller wood is to really key in on the minerals, where the, the bigger wood of the tree is, is a lot more carbon. That's what locks up nitrogen. And whether those be small pieces or big pieces, so the word chipped is in there because chipping exposes more of that inner green cambium cells, which makes the soluble lignans available to microbe transition. And so fresh is relevant if you really want to get like a fungal shot in the arm in deep in late fall. Um, it isn't necessarily, there's no one chipping brush on the edge of the forest in nature. So branches fall, things decay. You can utilize that principle too. You know, I often, when I'm pruning, I drop branches to the ground or if I cleaned up the raspberry patch, I'll put them in a low pocket and throw some soil over it. I kind of think of that as localized Google culture. And I'm using some terms that maybe not everyone knows, but uh, all of that is, is fungal banking. And you don't need a chipper to go about it. You just have to understand how getting it to the soil line is where the conversion to humic substances takes place. And you can accelerate it by chipping and exposing those soluble lignans, but that doesn't mean that you close the door and all that because you've got aged wood chips or you put out branches and you did some version of hulu culture. So I hope that helps and we can talk more. We have time for one more question. Maybe go in the back of it. I have a small orchard in a, what I would consider to be a semi-arid area. Um, and what we've had occur over the last five or six years is um, sudden die-off of beginning mostly with the soft fruits, all our plums, apricots, peaches, cherries, um, bearing heavily and then followed the next season by sudden death. And we've attributed it to a fungal disease that in our area we call it Texas root rot. You blame everything on Texas. Um, <laughs> or cotton root rot or phytophthora root rot. And I'm just wondering what, what I might do to change cultural practices so that we minimize the impact of that particular fungal um, actor and maximize the other more beneficial players? Well, I'd be happy to get into that with you more in depth, you know, but just in a broad sense. Um, there is a pathogenic parasitic organism in, in that soil causing this Texas root rot. And that organism can be pushed out by a healthy, vibrant, mycorrhizal ecosystem, and that ties to lots of plant diversity. So I, I'm going to have to talk to you more about like the practices you do and, and understand some of those pieces. But when I just talked about Romeo chip wood, you know, I present that under the rubric of fungal food uh, and getting that into your ecosystem because you want to feed the good fungi and, and push out the bad. That's, that's how I would, in a broad sense, approach what you just asked me. Thank you all. It's a real pleasure to be here.